So hi everyone and welcome to another Flan Talk. Today we have Yash Saraf here with us on the expressivity, uh, expressive ca uh, capacity of state space models, a formal language perspective. He's currently um, a master's student uh, with Michael Hahn and is looking for PhD positions starting next year, 2025 in autumn. You can take it from here. Thank you. Um, yeah, so welcome to the talk. Um, Lena already told you about the um, the title of the paper and the title of the paper is sort of a spoiler, like it's essentially all you need to know about the paper that we study expressivity in state space models. And um, so before um, we go ahead, because there's such a diverse background, we'll try to uh, sort of break down each uh, thing here. So what space, state space models are, what expressivity is, what, what do we mean by a formal language perspective? And so, um, yeah, like SSMs, um, like state space models, the idea was that RNNs, the essential problem with them is that they're not parallelizable during training, but they have a linear inference time and uh, transformers are the opposite. And so SSM was sort of born out of a need for optimizing and uh, at a name of getting a best of both worlds. And so the idea is that SSMs are while training, you can parallelize parts of them and during inference, it's linear time. And so, or at least subquadratic in some cases. And that's the overall idea of SSMs. Um, works is, this is essentially the base equation where uh, we update the hidden state um, by passing it through a residual uh, connection through the matrix B. And uh, we update the hidden state with this matrix A, which both, both of them can be functions of the input X. And so this inherently looks fairly similar to RNN, but the major difference is that there is no non-linearity while we are updating the hidden state. And this key difference allows faster training. This allows the parallelization. And um, there are two overall ways in which this parallelization works. One is the convolution view, and this is when this matrix A is common across inputs. And um, in that case, across time steps, we can just take A as a common factor, and that's how the convolution view sort of comes in, and which allows faster training. The other um, way, which is the more modern way, is something called prefix scan. And the idea there is that even though A and B are functions of the input, and they differ from time step to time step, we can still, because these are associative uh, owing to the non uh, no nonlinearity, we can still um, do a lot of these things in parallel. And so what we end up with is that during training, we can look at this uh, state space model, the same model through a convolutional lens and make everything faster. While at inference, we can um, look at it as a recurrence and therefore again, have faster evaluation and faster inference. And um, the overall motivation for studying expressivity was that there's a lot of research on expressivity of RNNs and transformers, some of them even before I was born. Uh, but research on expressivity of SSMs is fairly little. Um, like it should be mentioned that like Will Merrin is also on the call. And so like his paper in ICML was one of the first papers that sort of um, outlined that SSMs lie in this complexity class called TC0. Um, but still there's a lot less work compared to transformers here. And that's why we wanted to um, work on this. And uh, before we move forward, there's one major problem with uh, SSMs. SSMs are also called uh, linear RNNs because there's no non-linearity while updating. Uh, and the ma main problem here is that everyone has their own way of uh, naming things. And so I want to start with some like a very small um, thing. So these are like six different papers and all six of them have their own notation for describing the same SSM recurrence. Uh, can anyone like guess or like does anyone remember which one of these is Mamba? which is the most recent, like successful SSM. Is it uh, bottom left? Yeah, it's bottom left, yeah, perfect. So, but it's still, um, unless you sit down and like try to memorize each of them, it's very difficult to um, like keep track of things if everyone uses their own notation. And so because of that, like we, uh, we'll talk about, when we talk about SSMs, we'll talk about all such modern SSMs. And uh, to talk about all of them, uh, we have, uh, we're sort of redefining the equation in our own way. 
um, because why not? And uh, here the idea is that SSMs, a single layer SSM specifically, is simply a map uh, of uh, at input length t, which means essentially that it maintains the shape of the input, and the, so the output is the same shape as the input. And um, this is the recurrent uh, recurrence equation that we showed earlier. And uh, how this this is the way the hidden state is updated. But there's also like the way we get the output from it is we apply either two mixes or a normalize and with a normalization in the middle. And this these are functions of both the hidden state and the input. So essentially, if we uh, consider these two equations, they cover all um, SSMs like that that I showed in the slide earlier and a couple of more. So as, irrespective of the notation, this is what they boil down to. And here the key choices are with respect to how A is structured, how B is structured, and these mixes and norms. Uh, the norm can be layer norm, um, and the mixes can either be linear units, uh, gated linear units, or Swish GLU units. And uh, like although this is not that important, but GLU and SWIGLU are fairly similar to linear units. They are simply uh, the product of linear projections of the input, and uh, where one of them passes through a sigmoid. Um, and Although this is not that, uh, like the definitions of GLU and SWIGLU are not that important for this specific work, but it's just a way to talk about all SSMs at once with this, um, these two equations. Um, yep, and just to show you that I'm not kidding um, and I'm not cheating you, um, like I'll try to give uh, classify SSMs into two major kinds. Not, a, not really a classification, but two choices of how SSMs are generally designed. And uh, and they will all like be uh, somehow mapped to, to these two equations. And so time variant SSMs are when uh, we make a choice that this uh, input matrix A does not depend on the input at all. And this allows the convolution view that we talked about earlier. And so this factor of A can be taken common across different time steps and that uh, helps in faster training. And examples of these like are uh, Hungry Hippos, RetNet, and these were all sort of uh, the earlier versions of SSMs. And uh, this is this equation is for RetNet, and here uh, H is essentially the is S in that equation. B is the matrix K in this equation. Similarly, the mix here is simply um, a linear mapping. Um, and similarly, there's another category of SSMs where um, people said that A will be a function of input, so it will vary across time steps, but all the entries in this matrix A will be non-negative and so greater than zero. And one example of this is Mamba. And uh, in Mamba, this positive value comes in because the matrix A passes through exponential and that makes everything positive. Um, by the way, like there, I chose Mamba and RetNet here for a very specific reason. Um, they both have something to do with iClear. And does anybody know? It's a very silly reason for me choosing this, but. Like, does anybody want to go? Were they like, both re rejected? Yeah, yeah, both of them were rejected by iClear, but they're both influential in SSM space. Um, yeah, so this was about SSMs and now coming to the formal language that we talked about. And uh, before we go ahead, again, um, like just some definitions so that we are all on the same page. And um, with, within formal languages, there is something called star-free languages, which are a subclass of regular languages. And these require only three kinds of operations, union, products, and complements. And within the, with these three uh, operations, one can define um, the entire language. And so the most important thing is, here is that we don't use Clini star to actually describe the language. And uh, an example of that is the language of AB star. And um, like at, this is uh, like, although here we do use the star to like, express the language succinctly, but uh, we can also describe the language with just those three um, operations. And so the formula below just simply says that all strings that start with B, all strings that end with A, all strings that have two A's in the middle, and all strings that have two B's in the middle, we want all strings except of that. And so the only possibility that remains is if A and B keep alternating, uh, if they keep repeating. And so we were able to describe the language despite not using Clini star. Um, yep, there's 
another class of languages, which is the non-star free language. And essentially these are, uh, this is just um, all regular languages that are not star free. And the key difference here would be that they will require the inclusion of Clini star. Uh, an example would be A star. And here we can't use the same trick that we used last time. So if we say something like the uh, string should not start with A or it should not end with A or it should not have two A's in the mid consecutive A's, the definition of the language breaks. So here the inclusion of the clean star is critical. And um, A star is just a simpler version, let's say, of parity. And parity is uh, the language where we try to see whether the number of um, uh, so the, it'll gen generally be two two strings, uh, two characters will be part of the alphabet, and um, one of them will try to see if they uh, there are even number of them, and the other be ignored. So it's just a star with an additional neutral symbol. So if let's say we consider b to be the neutral symbol, then we don't care how many b's are there, but we we do care if um, the number of a's are matched evenly or not. And so again, before we move forward on how we do on parity. Um, I want to sort of differentiate between two ways of thinking about these formal languages. One is recognition. And so like, let's say these are two strings. Recognition is simply saying whether these two strings are part of a language or not. So in this case, for example, the first uh, case would be uh, not a part of parity and the second would be a part of parity. And recognition would be just saying this yes or no, like whether a given string is a part of a language or not, just uh, recognizing that fact. The other way to think about this is, um, say, is which is a slightly tougher problem, is predictive modeling. And predictive modeling is essentially saying that once you have been given a prefix, what are the next possible continuations for one to stay in the language? And so um, if the prefix is 010, it could be followed by either 0 and we'll still stay in parity. However, if we have um, the the same case as recognition, we also are allowed to have the end of sequence symbol because um, we are we have sort of uh, a, a case where we can accept this string as a parity as part of parity. And so which is why predictive modeling sort of subsumes recognition because if you have end of sequence as one of the possible next characters, then we know that we can recognize that language as well. And if EOS is not part of the next sequence symbols, then um, it's it's not recognized like it's not part of the language and so um predictive modeling is a tougher task compared to recognition and we'll try to um use predictive modeling wherever we can to show our results now um, again this is a result that has been done to death uh, rnns do really well on parity the reason for that is that rnns sort of mimic uh, finite state automata really well and so if a language can be represented through a finite state automata um, rnns are probably going to be doing well on it whereas uh, if you look at transformers uh, transformers don't do that well on parity and this was uh, one of the works that uh, my colleague mark and of course michael did this year they won the best paper award on this uh, in acl uh, and essentially the idea was that parity is a sensitive function what that implies is that um, if you change the input even by one bit the output immediately changes and that's very simple to see because like the number of even bits or the number of odd bits changes as soon as you flip either uh, the, a 1 to a 0 or a 0 to 1. And the idea was that all sensitive functions, they, when, we try to, when we try to train transformers on it, the lost landscape is very sharp. And so reaching the solution is fairly tough. And what that implies is that, let's say we, we have the optimum, if we add a little bit of noise to the to the optimal position, the loss leaves, uh, increases uh, exponentially. And that causes uh, the minima to be brittle and such things are very difficult to find um, for transformers. But coming to our paper, which is how do SSMs perform on it? And so like this will be, I'll try to make a very trivial solution. And um, I've just rewritten the SSM recurrence with the equation that we had sort of pictorial, pictorially here. And uh, this, um, the way to read this diagram is that X is your input, B controls how much of the input passes to the hidden state, A controls how much of the past hidden state stays in, and uh, mix or norm just passes off the hidden state plus the input to uh, the output. And this is sort of the same diagram for parity, uh, an FSA that solves parity. And uh, if we sort of try to convert our SSM recurrence to this FSA, 
what we can do is we can ignore the B matrix because we see that here all all we want is H to have two possible um, cases and H to sort of um, the hidden state to um, switch between those two cases. And so what we want is the input to not like the B to not affect anything, but this A matrix to control everything. And so I claim that this solution that we have is the same as this FSA that I've drawn. And so, uh, sorry. This solution, although the solution looks looks correct at, at first glance, it's actually there's a major problem here, which is that we had two kinds of SSMs, right? That either it would be time invariant or it would be time uh, or it would be non-negative. But here we have assumed both that input is either the uh, matrix A depends on the input, and so it is time variant, and the value of uh, input uh, matrix A is negative, which is so this uh, is not. This does not agree with the fact that modern SMs are either time invariant or non-negative. And so, although this solution would have been trivial, but there are design choices that people make while making SSMs, which prohibit such kind of a construction. And this brings to our brings us to our first theorem, and which is non-negative SMs can SSMs cannot recognize parity at arbitrary input lengths and with finite precision. Um, the way we prove this is like I'll just go through uh, sort of a very hand wavy proof. Um, just to give some intuition. And the idea of the proof is that we take inputs of the form like a bunch of ones. And what that means is that because um, for this kind of input, our activations will converge as this N increases. And uh, the way this proof works is that because our X is the same, it's only ones, the matrix B and the matrix A become constant. And so our recurrence equation converts to something like this. And like this, in this equation, if our alpha is um, greater than one, then this value will blow up. And uh, the if alpha is less than one, then it'll converge to a very small point. And if alpha is one, it'll again diverge, but uh, at a slower rate. And uh, irrespective of the divergence, because we have a layer norm uh, next, it'll converge everything to a very small value. And so overall for the input, the entire uh, activation will converge to um, to a point and which is why it's impossible to learn recognize parity at arbitrary input lengths. And this is our major first result. And yep, ir like irrespective of the choice of mix one norm or mix two, this idea will still remain the same. Um, the other sort of a corollary of this proof is that even time invariant SSMs cannot recognize parity. Uh, although there are some like caveats to this, um, to this um, result, which is that if we have complex valued gates, as long as each entry in this matrix here has a, has a ra rational angle in the complex plane, we will still not be able to recognize parity. And this is sort of just um, nitty gritties, but it's very unlikely that people will have irrational angles in the complex plane because um, representing irrational angles with finite precision is almost impossible. And so this is just to be more correct, but the idea is that even time invariant SSMs with finite precision should not be able to recognize parity. And the idea of the proof, the intuition is sort of similar that if we expand the A recurrence, we'll get several components and some of them will depend on the sequence length T and the other ones, um, uh, others will not. The ones that will not, we can sim simply take that as a constant. And the ones that will, again, make similar to, to our last case, it'll either uh, cause the entire product to diverge exponentially or converge or diverge linearly. And the norm after the after this hidden state update will cause everything to converge to, a, say, to the same point. And so we'll both with time invariant SSMs and with non-negative SSMs, we'll not be able to recognize parity. Yep. And so this bring, brings us to our major takeaway, um, which is that wherever modular counting is involved and non-star free languages generally require this, uh, in case of parity, the modular counting is two. So you have to count from one to, and then again, go to zero depending. And that's how you can gen like uh, see whether your parity is maintained or not. And um, we have, we ran a bunch of experiments as well in conjunction with the theoretical results. And uh, this graph might be a lot to look at, but essentially there are four bars per language and the blue bars correspond to SSMs. The orange bars sort of correspond to transformers. The fully shaded bar is the in distribution data set. The dotted bar is the out of distribution data set to test whether length generalization works. The transformer results have been taken from uh, Bhattamishra 2020. Um, 
and the SSM results uh, were what we got. And as you can see, in none of the cases, like in all cases, the results are pretty bad. And um, in none of them, we get length generalization. And so um, in simpler terms, um, SSMs will in general always struggle with modular counting. And the cause of this is the design choice of making SSMs either non-negative or time invariant. Coming to our second result, which is, and before we go to the second result, we sort of have to introduce the language. And th there's this language called flip-flop, which essentially uh, in, in this language, all the inputs are of a specific form. The form is you'll have an instruction bit and the following bit will be the data bit. And the instruction can either be W, I, and R, which corresponds to write, ignore, and read. And the data bit can either be zero or one. And uh, the idea is that the last data bit after your uh, bit after the latest write instruction needs to be outputted after we see the read instruction. So in this case, because the last data bit that was written was zero, when we see a R, uh, then we should be outputting the same data bit, which is zero in this case. And um, this language was sort of introduced in the NeurIPS uh, 2023 paper by Bingman Liu, uh, exposing attention glitches with flip-flop language modeling. And this was uh, a major uh, problem with like, so they essentially showed that transformers are not able to solve this language. And why we should care about this language is because it can be very loosely argued that this is a proxy for closed domain hallucinations. And so given that you have the answer in your um, context, then the fact that transformers can't solve flip-flop, it's likely that it, it's also going to hallucinate in closed domain uh, applications when the answer is in the context. Um, and this is these are all results from their paper. What they saw was that with LSTMs, you barely need to make any effort and within 100 uh, iterations, you we get zero test error, even with a simple one layer as LSTM and the in distribution and in both in distribution and out of distribution. However, for transformers, irrespective of how much you want to train, like irrespective of how uh, big you make the uh, layers, how much you increase the dimension size, how many heads you deploy, um, the transformer still is not able to learn this language. And just to give, get perspective, this uh, green line is how LSTMs learn, whereas this the other lines are for transformers. And so LSTMs are just much, much, much better in this specific language. And uh, the reason for that is that attention heads are generally competitive and attending to, to the last right token requires extremely strong positional dependence in attention scores. And this is something that's not that trivial to do with, um, with softmax. And um, this is again, uh, one more definition. Um, so set reset automatons are a kind of automaton where you have an FSA, but the alphabet also has the states in it. So the states are also part of the alphabet, except for the initial state. And how the automaton works is that your transition function, if it gets uh, the, the, the symbol that it gets is also a state, then it switches to that state. But if that symbol is not a state, then it simply retains the old value. Yeah. Um, and so this essentially is like if, it can be intuitively seen that it's very similar to flip-flop, uh, which is we, if we want a solution to flip-flop, we want something like a set reset automaton to be implemented by our architecture, which is that we want to be recording the last seen symbol from our designated set. Um, and so we'll try to create a construction for flip-flop uh, by sort of using this set reset automaton um, that we saw. And here the, States are our instruction bits, which is W, R, and I, and the data bits are what we ignore. And um, so the idea is that if we see the instruction bits, then we save it to our hidden state. If we see the data bits, then we ignore them and we don't write it to the hidden state, but we read the value of the hidden state. And with this, we will always have access to the latest instruction in our hid hidden state, as well as we can use uh, the mix and non to simply as a residual token pass the current data bit as well. So we'll, we'll always have the latest instruction as well as the current token with a one layer SSM, which is uh, and one intermediate result that we found while constructing the solution was that 
one layer SSM can simulate uh, a set reset automaton. And this is essentially a set reset automaton where W, R, I are part of your states and zero and one are not. And um, what we do with this uh, output that we get from the first layer is we uh, construct another set reset automaton. And in this case, if we have the latest instruction as the right instruction, then we use the value in the current token and write it to our hidden state. If we have any other instruction there, then we ignore the value and simply retain the old value. So Sim very similar to our layer one construction. And so with this layer two, what we end up with is that our hidden state always has the correct value in it. So if you if it it always records the last data bit that was uh, found after the latest write instruction. And uh, with uh, mixing and with normalization, we can forward the value of the this this value from the hidden state and give it as an output. And so it like using this, it's fairly trivial to see that how we can solve flip-flop using SSMs. And uh, we all validated it through experiments and uh, we have experiments here with both Mamba and Griffin. And the idea here, the green line corresponds to the in distribution set and the orange line corresponds to the out of distribution set. And in both cases, we are converging to um, zero error pretty soon. It does not uh, converge as fastly as LSTMs, but it does converge to zero error. Yeah, which means that SSMs are able to solve a major critical failure mode of self-attention. But what does that mean? Does that mean SSMs are better than transformers? The answer is no. Because, uh, but before we go go to that, I'll. Uh, this is more formally our result, which is that the two-layer SSM can predictively model the flip-flop language and it can do it at arbitrary input lengths and even with finite precision. And um, the other result, why we say that we can't really say whether SSMs are better or transformers are better is because um, there are things that transformers can do which SSMs can't. And one such result was shown by this paper that again was presented in ICML, which is a repeat after me, transformers are better than SSMs at copying. And I really like the title of this paper because the title of the paper is this line, but repeated again and um, sort of copied again. Um, but how we should look at this graph is that um, the blue lines corresponds to um, transformers and the orange and the brownish line corresponds to SSMs. And it's again, like the graph clearly shows that as the number of tokens increase, the number of tokens to copy, uh, SSMs really are not able to perform copying, whereas um, uh, transformers are. So our major takeaway from this theorem that we have is that the abilities between SSMs and transformers are complementary. They're not really, it's it, although both might be in TC0, it's not really clear whether one is better than the other. And so this points to the fact that there probably might be hybrid architectures which uh, exploit both the SSM recurrence as well as the uh, transformer self-attention me mechanism. And so we'll for sure see some kind of hybrid architectures in the future. And in fact, the future is not that far ahead. Uh, there have already been a lot of papers that have tried out this hybrid architecture. And I'll want to just uh, show this. Uh, so this one is, uh, this graph is from the paper, an empirical study of Mamba-based language models. And uh, what they showed was that they trained uh, Mamba2 transformers, as well as a hybrid architecture, again, based on Mamba2, uh, with some self-attention uh, in it. And in they tested this, their trained model on a variety of tasks. This is just uh, one sample graph that I've shown. But in this case, you can see the hybrid architecture, which is the blue line, is higher than the green and the orange lines, and which sort of points to the fact that hybrid architectures are performing better than either of them individually. But of course, this is um, a lot more, it's not that trivial to say that um, how, like, so even though hybrid architectures might be the future, it's not very clear as to how much recurrence has to be there and how much self-attention has to be there, in which layer it has to be there. So there's a lot of research still pending to be done here, but it does point to a fact that hybrid architectures are worth a try. And uh, coming to um, one more result that we have, and there was a discussion on 
on uh, the flying discord server i think on saturday or something where people were discussing whether crone roads theorem is uh, useful in today's day and age and um, so um, i'm not sure about in like how useful it is it outside of uh, our uh, like in general but we did use crone roads for one of our theorems and so the idea was that um, we've already shown that flip flop state tracking is fairly similar to set reset automatons and set reset automatons can be simulated by a single layer SSM. And this, this is a very old result that all any counter free finite state automaton is simply a cask can be broken down uh, as a cascade of simpler set reset automatons. And this is essentially uh, a consequence of the crone Rhodes theorem and the Schutzenberger theorem. And uh, so we already have this result. And uh, so all we need to show to say that we also can model all star free languages, if we show that uh, we can also module, uh, simulate a cascade of simpler reset automatons, uh, we don't need to show anything for counter free FSA because we can utilize this uh, fact from Crone Roads theorem. And we already showed that um, a single layer SS SSM does simulate uh, a one, one layer of uh, set reset automaton. And, uh, we also were able to fairly sim trivially show like there's a proof in the paper where we can stack a bunch of these set reset automatons and they uh, again uh, quite they they are a very good equivalent of the cascade of set reset automatons and the only thing that needs to be like the only nitty gritty there is the fact that so if you have uh, a diagram like this where the input alphabet is going to the automaton one and the state that A1 reaches is Q1, then instead of uh, us just giving um, the input alphabet to A2, we'll combine the alphabet, the alphabet sort of changes to be uh, a cascade product of the input alphabet and the state that A1 reaches. And that's how you, we can, that, uh, that with that change, we can simulate a set reset, autom like a cascade of set reset automatons pretty uh, trivially with SSMs. And um, this brings us to our next theorem, which is that, Non-negative SSMs can predictably model uh, regular languages if the language is star-free, using the the intuition that I showed just earlier. And uh, it again, it can do that with finite precision. Um, we also tested this empirically, and this is again uh, a diagram which is fairly similar to the diagram that we had earlier, wherein each language has four bars. The orange bars correspond to transformers. The blue bars correspond to SSMs. And uh, you can see that the in both the kinds of blue bar, the, both the sh completely shaded one and the dotted one, they're always 100% across all languages. And so these are all like examples of uh, regular languages. But in all cases, uh, SSMs are able to predictably model star-free languages. But for transformers, it's not really very clear. Like for some languages, they are able to do it. For long, some languages, they are not able to le learn length generalized length generalizable solutions, but they are able to do it for in distribution. So uh, in this, which brings us to our next takeaway, which is that exact characterization of transformers in the finite state case is a difficult problem. Um, although it must be mentioned that the BRAS paper that um, uh, Andy, Dana Angulin and David Chang had um, showed that for uh, masked hard attention transformers, we can exactly characterize them but uh, it's uh, like there are many other kinds of attention and realistic transformers don't really use hard attention. So uh, it's not very clear how to do it with, let's say, uh, softmax attention. Uh, the characterization of transformers there is slightly more difficult. Whereas for the SSMs we analyzed, they are all real world SSMs. The, uh, the recurrence is how people use it. Uh, and we have considered the possible design choices as well. And so the this essentially means that with SSMs, we are able to exactly characterize that they will always be able to recognize exactly the star free languages. Uh, before I move forward, uh, I'll stop for a while for questions um, because I've been speaking for a while. Does anybody want to ask anything? Uh, I have a question. Um, yeah. So on, on the like construction uh, you gave to simulate the set reset mm -hmm. um, automaton, does that assume a particular type of SSM, um, like a, like a Mamba parameterization, or um, yeah, like like is that possible across different types of SSMs? So we showed it for um, so uh, yeah, 
here it is. Yeah, we did not show it for um, time invariant SSMs. We showed it for non-negative SSMs. And so for non-negative SSMs, it should be possible. But for time invariant, it's not very clear whether it will be possible. Like that will require some more, some like some more work, a different construction probably. Cool. Thanks. Uh, okay. So yeah, I'll move forward. Um, coming to our like this, uh, we're sort of near to the, near the end. Um, another interesting problem that has been studied in case of formal languages is uh, unbounded counting. And an example of this is the language A and B N, where uh, we want to match the number of A's. Uh, and the number of B's that occur in sequence, and um, it's essentially and the way we one would trivially want to solve it is we start counting up A's and once we reach a point, uh, we start counting down as, as soon as we see the B's here. And there was uh, a paper by Gail Weiss in 2018, which showed that um, RNNs uh, like LSTMs are able to do it. And they exactly, the, <clears throat> the algorithm that we intuitively think of is the way that LSTMs also solve this, so this task and the activation pattern sort of is very, I find this to be very nice where it goes up as we keep encountering A's and starts going down as we start uh, encountering B's. Similarly, the Pertamishra 2020 paper showed that for transformers as well. And uh, here, although this might be a little difficult to, to read, but um, the idea here is that this this is not exactly for, for a different kind of bound, uh, unbounded counting where we want to match the parenthesis, so open and close parenthesis. And you can see that for opening brackets, we have positive values and cor correspondingly for closing brackets, we have a similar value, which is, but just the negative form. So like for, for example, the it's minus 24 and 24. And although the, it's not exactly the same, but it, again, it sort of points to the fact that it's also trying to um, solve the task similar to how humans think of solving this task. And uh, yep. What we try to do is try to solve this using um, SSMs. And uh, although we said that the non-negative SSMs matrix A cannot be negative, but the matrix B can be. So with that in mind, the solution becomes fairly trivial. And uh, so whenever we see the tokens where we want to count up, we start um, increasing, incrementing the hidden state and by setting the value of both the B matrix and the A matrix as one. And this essentially boils down to this equation where we just keep incrementing the value of the hidden state. And uh, once, once we start seeing the token where we want to count down from, we simply set the value of the matrix to negative one. And uh, with that, the solution becomes simply the, the new value of hidden state uh, simply is one less than the old value. And with this, it's fairly trivial to see how uh, we can solve something like A and B N. And, um, here, however, there was a disparity between our theoretical construction and what we saw empirically. And uh, empirically, we saw that uh, none of our solutions length generalized. And this is possibly one area where like some future work needs to be done as to why accounting is difficult for um, SSMs, but uh, because theoretically they should be able to solve this. And um, nevertheless, like um, a more formal way of stating our theorem is that SSMs can predictively model languages like Dyke one Shuffle Dyke, Boolean expressions, A and B, and all of these are kinds of uh, counting um, languages. Um, when, but here we sort of change our definition of finite precision. We do allow finite fractional number of bits, but because we need to count up depending on the input length, we uh, so and our counts will keep increasing if we have an increasing input we need unbounded integer number of bits to be able to predictively model such languages. So, which is why, except for this, in every other case, our definition of finite precision was simply finite fractional number of bits and finite uh, integer number of bits. But for this specific case, uh, we sort of change our finite precision assumption. Yep, this is our last um, result, which is the language uh, of bounded dike. Um, Essentially, bounded dike is just a variation of the dike language where we don't allow unbounded depth. So we say that the number of brackets that can be opened at a point of time is limited. And it's 
bounded by the uh, the value m here k is the ty type of brackets and m is the maximum depth that one can reach and uh, we again try to solve it through predictive modeling and um, why this language might be interesting is because people have argued that uh, this dyke language sort of is very similar to how syntax trees are and how center embedding works in languages and so there is a parallel to be drawn between how language the the hierarchical structure of language and the hierarchical structure of dyke and uh, it was a very um, weird results that transformers were not able to do dyke that well um, which is why which prompted some research into like changing the definition of dyke which is you using bounded dyke where because even in human language it's very uh, unlike we are unlikely to see uh, like for example center embedding to be more than let's say four or five is generally bounded by a finite value and which is why uh, people started studying bounded dike and uh, what people found was that both transformers and LSTMs sorry uh, are able to solve bounded dike uh, LSTMs require a bit more memory transformers can do it with uh, smaller memory but transformers require specific positional encodings to be able to solve this the specific positional encoding being the position divided by the length of the sequence which is n and these were two uh, papers one by john hewitt in 2020 that was presented in emnlp he showed the results for rnns and a paper by shunyu yao which which showed the paper for uh, transformers but coming to our question as to how ssms do first of all because dyke knm dyke, uh, bounded dyke is a regular language a solution was guaranteed because of the because of what we showed earlier however uh, it was not very clear whether the solution we will get will be an efficient one and um, what we found uh, we were able to construct a solution where we did not require an require an explicit stack to actually do the counting we we, we can solve this uh, solve bounded dike through a very similar mechanism through how we did unbounded counting and so we instead of uh, using a stack uh, like the previous uh, constructions did uh, by previous i mean the constructions i think for um, if i'm not wrong the construct uh, like correct me if i'm going wrong here but i think the construction that people used for transformers required uh, an explicit stack or I might be wrong here, um, but one of LSTMs or transformers required explicit stack to uh, the solution to that uh, to this bounded dike. But our construction is simply is fairly similar to the unbounded counting construction, where if we see the opening bracket, we increment. If we see the closing bracket, we decrease. Uh, we decrease. So the output of the first layer will we'll always have the depth of each bracket at all points throughout our time steps with our first layer. And the second layer is simply going to check whether we have reached maximum depth or not. And if you have start reached maximum depth, we can start closing. And so our output can predict uh, the closing brackets. Whereas if you've not reached the maximum, then we can still allow opening or closing of brackets as uh, so there's no restriction yet. And which, um, yeah, so which we also tested this empirically. And I really like these graphs because they sort of tell the story pretty clearly, which is that one layer Mamba is never, like a one layer SSM is not able to perform this bounded dike, um, bounded dike language, but a two layer SSM is uh, does bounded dike with very fairly low memory. So even with 25 memory dimensions, uh, a one layer, a two layer Mamba is able to uh, get 100% accuracy on bounded dike. Whereas even if we keep increasing the memory dimensions, even beyond 100, this um, a one layer um, SSM is never able to solve it. And similar results were found for Griffin. More formally, our, uh, our theorem states that a two layer SSMs will be able to predictively model a bounded dike language. And the memory required, the hidden dimension would be O of M log K, where M is the maximum depth and K is the number of bracket, type of brackets. And here we have a finite precision again. Um, but this finite precision is not the same as the last time. This uh, this assumes finite number of fractional bits and finite number of integer bits. And so the major takeaway there is that SSMs are, will be able to keep track of bounded hierarchical structures and they'll be able to do so fairly efficiently. And so it is a good choice for modeling hierarchical structure of languages. And so it is a good choice for making SSMs out of it. Like, of course, people are already making it, but uh, it's good to have theoretical backing all the theoretical backing comes retrospectively.
so that that that's about it those were our results but um, before moving forward i would again like like to stop for some questions um, okay i'll move forward then um so of course um, there were a lot of things that we did not do in this paper which is that we don't really make comments on whether languages will learn whether things will generalize so uh, our comments about learnability and generalizability are fairly limited and or non-existent secondly our positive claims will need more empirical evidences across like all kinds of systems that are there even though theoretically those things should exist but as we saw for the uh, unbounded counting case that even though we had a theoretical solution to it, uh, the real world, uh, like we were not able to train SSMs that would lend generalize on those kinds of problems. And lastly, there are many kinds of SSMs. And even though we do talk about all of them with this uh, structure that we had of mix one norm and mix two, there are still sort of fairly small implementational differences between uh, SSMs and um, one example is uh, the SSM AGRN2, where the input matrix we are related, and uh, that sort of means that we can't the the we we sort of arbitrarily chose A and B in our all in all our theoretical solutions till now, and so that wouldn't be possible with something like AGRN2. And so, depending on the exact SSM, some uh, more uh, the exact implementational differences will make a huge difference to the expressivity. But overall, um, for most SSMs, our assumptions, like with the assumptions that we had, which is for time invariant SSMs, and uh, the prime example there being uh, Mamba, and with uh, non negative SSMs, the prime example being something like RetNet, there uh, our solutions should, should uh, work. And this is just a small recap because uh, I dumped a lot of uh, information right now. So, just recapping all our main theorems. Um, in the finite precision case where we have fractional number, bounded fractional and bounded integer bits, non-negative SSMs should not be able to recognize parity at arbitrary input lengths. They should be able to predictively model uh, like regular language, only star field uh, regular languages. Um, a two-layer SSM as a consequence of this predictively models flip-flop language models at arbitrary lengths. Although solutions were guaranteed with Crohn roots, uh, uh, we show that a two-layer SSM can do it. So a very like flip-flop can be done fairly efficiently. Similarly, bounded die can also be done fairly efficiently. And uh, where we sort of changed our definition of finite precision with uh, by allowing unbounded integer values and finite uh, fractional components, we we will be able to predictively model all of these counter languages, die, shuffle, Boolean expressions, ANBN style of languages. Yep. And so this was the more formal recap of our theorems. But more informally, uh, SSMs are a good choice for LLMs because they are able to model hierarchical structure of language. They cannot do modular counting. And so something like parity is fairly hard. Um, it's, it's, it will be easier to predict how LLMs uh, based on SSMs would fare in, like, in real world scenarios because we are able to characterize that, okay, SSMs are able to exactly characterize uh, star field languages so it would be slightly easier compared to transformers to predict the failures and abilities of the llms that will be um, based on pu purely ssms and finally llms should probably will probably start to have hybrid architectures in the near future yeah uh, and that's about it um the we can go for questions now